I'd like you all to take a moment and close your eyes. Think about a time when you were happy. Open your eyes. In that moment that you thought of, what were you doing? Were you alone? Were you with friends? Why do you think you were happy? And why do you think you thought of that moment? Hold on to those answers, we'll come back to them later. I'm going to tell you three stories. My talk is entitled Stories of Joy. Um, and I hope that they'll enlighten a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about. So about two years ago, I went on vacation with my family to Massachusetts and we ended up in Cape Cod. And if you don't know this, President Kennedy was from Cape Cod, his family had a house there. And so we went to the Kennedy Memorial. We're on the water, the memorial faces the ocean, and I turn and there's a pathway that leads down closer to the water and I see a swing set. Now I don't know about you guys, but my favorite playground item as a child were the swings. And I'll tell you why. It's because on them you have a freedom that you feel on no other item of playground equipment. And for me, it was that I felt like I could fly. So in a moment that my five-year-old self would have been immensely proud of, I took off running toward the ocean. And ladies, if you've ever worn wedges, you know that this is not an easy task to do while you're wearing them. But regardless, there I go. And when I reach the swing set, I realize I've been joined by my sister. And a quick note on Kristen, she is three years older than me. She just turned 25, and she has Down syndrome. So she's obviously a lot shorter than me. I am wearing heels in this picture, so it's not that big of a difference, but significantly. And she often views me as a role model or as the older one. So she sits down next to me on a swing and looks at me and is like, will you push me? And honestly, how do you say no to a face like that? So I get off the swing and I start pushing her and I'm telling her to pump her legs and she's doing it. And I look at her and I'm like, Chris, you know, you can do this on your own. And she looked at me and she was like, by myself? Which has often become the response that Kristen has when people tell her that she can do things by herself. And I said, yeah, you can do this on your own. Is it okay if I sit down? And she looked at me and said, yes. And so we sit down on the swings and we're starting to pump our legs together. And this was the moment that followed. A year ago, I volunteered at Camp Boggy Creek for the first time. And a little background on Boggy, it's a camp for kids with chronic and terminal illnesses, uh, and they do family weekends during the school year. So I volunteered on a cancer weekend to go hang out with a kid who had cancer. My first child, we'll call her Steph for the sake of the story, was a 10-year-old cancer survivor. She had Ewing sarcoma and was in remission. And when Steph first got to camp, I was excited to have her there. She was excited to be there, but she was also a little reserved. Not really sure if she could trust me, not really sure if we could actually connect. We did by the end of the weekend, but that moment couldn't have happened until the first morning. Steph woke up and decided that she wanted to go down to the dock and paddle boat and fish. And so here I was, 20 years old, with a 10-year-old, we're getting ready to go on a dock, and I have to admit to her that I don't know how to paddle boat. And she looks at me and is like, really? You've never been on a paddle boat? I was like, no, I haven't. And she was like, please tell me you know how to fish. <laughs> Awkward. Uh, no, I don't, actually. And she was like, well, I guess I'm just going to have to teach you. And I said, well, I guess you are. And what followed was a string of moments in which Steph and I connected. Um, she was able to teach me things, I was able to teach her things. We had an all-around awesome weekend. On Saturday night, we were doing crafts, and we had talked about her best friend earlier in the weekend, and I found best friend charms in this little tub of jewelry items. I was like, oh, Steph, I can make a bracelet for you and a bracelet for your best friend. What's her name again? And she looks at me and smiles and says, Natalie. And so I end up with half of a heart from a little girl with cancer. When I started college, I decided I was going to join a religious organization. I joined Baptist Collegiate Fellowship here at Stetson. 
And this group is incredible in so many ways, and I could list them all, but it would take too much time. Um, but basically what we do is come together as a faith community, and we really bond, and we really connect, and we really became this very tight-knit group of friends. And I'm sure you guys have had this experience where you, you are friends with people, and it just clicks. Something there, and it can be a big group or a small group, but you feel like you belong there. You feel accepted. You feel like you can be who you are with these people. And so every year for spring break, we take a mission trip, an alternative spring break trip, around places where we can drive. Generally, we drive these giant 12 passenger vans you can see behind us. And this year, we went to Asheville, North Carolina. And every year, we open this trip up to the entire campus so that other people can be involved and see what we do and serve. And this year was no exception. We had two students who joined us who knew one other person that was going. Their friends had convinced them to come. And it was, their names are Jacob and Pamela. And they decided that they were going to come into this really tight-knit group of friends for a whole week and serve people who needed our help. Over the course of the week, I got to know Jacob and Pamela. And I can tell you that they probably feel as much a part of this group as anyone who, who does um, that's been part of it since the beginning, or since I've been here, at least for my four years. And it's amazing that that can take place in the course of a week. And even though they may not be the same religiously, they may not be the same eth ethnically, they may not be the same as any of us on the trip, something incredible still happens there. So on the surface, these are stories of joy, these are stories of happiness, they're stories where people are happy, but really what's key here is that there are moments that happiness were created. There weren't just moments where people were happy. It was an active process where people were creating happiness for one another. You all may or may not know this, but last week, last Thursday, was the International Day of Happiness. It's an initiative put on by the UN because they've decided that happiness is something that needs to be promoted worldwide. Happiness is not just for the elite. Happiness is for everyone, and happiness and well-being is what they promote during the International Day of Happiness. One of their partners is called Action for Happiness, the Action for Happiness Project, and this data comes from their website. What it says is that 50% of our happiness is predetermined by genetics. We're predisposed to be a happier person or a less happy person, depending on who our parents are. 40%, they say, is determined by us autonomously. What we decide will make us happy. And 10% is determined by income or environment. I argue something a little different. I think that we can control at least 5% of that 10 in our environment. So instead of having control of only 40% of our happiness, I think that we have control of at least 45. The Action for Happiness Project also puts forth these 10 keys to living a happier life. Giving, relating, exercising, appreciating, trying out, direction, resilience, emotion, acceptance, and meaning. A lot of these are self-explanatory. Giving, volunteerism will pro promote happiness. Exercise promotes happiness because the endorphins. Resilience in situations that are difficult, having direction and meaning in life, feeling like you're accepted by a group of people. These are all key in living happier lives. But I think that there's something missing. And it's great that they had these 10 keys, but I think that you have to have something before you can actually implement those 10 keys into your life. And I think that thing is courage. And this is not courage as we've come to understand courage as bravery or extraordinary acts. We often use courage when we talk about firefighters and police officers and military personnel. And that, for a lot of people, makes them feel like courage is out of reach. To be courageous, they have to be something more than what they already are. But if you go back to courage in the original root of the word cur in the Latin means heart. And that's where the word courage comes from. There's a researcher out of Texas, her name is Brene Brown, and she defines courage as telling the story of who you are with your whole heart. It's being exactly who you are and being comfortable with that. That's courage. Now, courage is not easy. Courage shouldn't be easy. It's not something that should look simple on the outside. For example, if you knew me in high school, you would never guess for a single moment that I would be standing here on this stage in front of all of you giving this talk. <coughs> in high school, I was very different. 
Um, and I decided that when I got to college, I was going to be who I was at my core. I wasn't going to hide. And I had been friends with some of my friends in high school since second grade. And I don't think any of them knew me, just me, for who I was. So I made a conscious decision when I came to college that I was going to be me, whatever that meant. And I was lucky enough to find a group who fosters that kind of love and encouragement, and I was able to do just that. The common thread through all the stories that I told is not necessarily the creating happiness part of it. It's that all these people had courage. They were telling the story of who they were with their whole heart, and they weren't hiding. In the story with my sister and I, Kristen had to have the courage to ask for help. Kristen accepts that she has limitations and that she can't always do everything. I had to have the courage to turn around and say, yes, you can. In the story with Steph, she had to have the courage to go to camp, which guaranteed is not an easy thing for any kid to do. She also had the courage to stand up to a 20-year-old, someone twice her age, and tell them, you don't know how to do this, <laughs> really, and have the courage to teach me. And I had to have the courage to listen and to learn. In the story of Pamela and Jacob, they had to have the courage to come on a trip with a group of already established friends and be comfortable with who they were in order to get to know us. And we had to have the courage to accept them for who they were and to bring them in and make them feel like they were a part of the group. So what I'd like you all to leave with today is that happiness can be created in a multitude of ways. Some people think that creating happiness means accumulating wealth or becoming successful. Some people think that creating happiness is surrounding yourself with a group of people who will make you feel your best. I want you all to think that creating happiness comes from being who you are and having the courage to stand there unapologetically and say, this is me. Thank you.